Welcome to the uh, Kaplan Pavilion here at the University of Virginia School of Law. My name is Tim Longo. I'm an associate professor here in the School of Continuing and Professional Studies and very privileged to be part of the adjunct faculty as a lecturer here at the School of Law. I was reminded as I was preparing for this morning of a talk that I gave on behalf of Professor John Norton Moore at the uh, National Press Club. It was one of many scholarly talks, if you will, on the topic of what I call relational policing. And I wanted to share with you some excerpts from that talk because I think it lays a nice foundation for this morning's time together. For more than 30 years, I've had the great honor and privilege of being a police officer. And during that time, I've watched closely this profession of mine evolve. The evolution of policing in America has impacted our strategies to reduce crime, to maintain safe and healthy communities, and improve the relationships with those whom we serve. Now, one important aspect of this evolution that has profoundly impacted policing in America is this broader concept of what has been termed community policing. And within it, the notion of problem solving and how both police departments and their communities contribute to the development of positive, long-term relationships. And importantly, a collaborative effort to identify solutions to the ongoing problems that communities and families face every day. From my perspective, community policing is about engaging police and citizens in a relationship that is aimed at addressing community needs and problems, reducing crime and the fear of crime, the implementation of long-term and sustainable strategies that result in safer communities, and an overall improvement in the quality of an individual's life and the lives of their family. Indeed, community policing has been a guiding force for America for decades. Yet events that have occurred across our nation over the past several years have caused many to question whether the underlying principles of community policing and the importance of police and citizen relationships remain a priority in how police officers and their agencies go and about this important public work. Now, it's neither my purpose nor my intent to confirm or dispel whether the police have fallen short as to their relationship with those whom they serve. Rather, I wish to underscore the importance of what I branded as relational policing and how that interacts with the broader concept of police legitimacy, a concept that has been at the forefront of policing for the past several years, and one, in my opinion, that is critical to restoring the public's trust and confidence where those crucial elements have been so deeply compromised. At 21 years of age, I walked the streets of West Baltimore. I patrolled the stairwells and hallways and courtyards of the George Murphy and Lexington Terrace public housing projects. Yet somehow along the way, I began to recognize the importance of engaging people, developing relationships, and getting to know the people who made up the place where I came to work every day. For me, those relationships were as important to my work as the technical skills I had learned in the police academy and the various tools that occupied both my gun belt and the cockpit of that police car. Community policing was real and its benefits then were obvious to me then and they are now. Many years later, I've come to believe that there has emerged an ever-growing fracture in the relationship between the police and the communities we serve. I say this not as a criticism aimed at either of the parties, but rather as a firm belief that the tragedies that have occurred across our nation that result from police and citizen interactions gone bad, and the manner in which people have reacted to those tragedies have threatened both the quality of relationships and this whole notion of police legitimacy. It's been said over the past few years that these are difficult times to be a cop in America. I think not. In fact, it's my sincere belief we've never been presented with a greater opportunity, an opportunity to demonstrate the character of this profession, the men and women who serve it, and most importantly, to rethink policing in America. So that's why we're here, to begin a discussion about rethinking policing in America. 
I've been privileged to have been invited to this place, this university, this institution of higher learning, to be part of the creation of a curriculum, a program to rethink American policing as we move forward in the 21st century. And if the state affords us the opportunity to do that and call this a degree program someday, that's, in, that's exactly what we'll do. And I'm privileged this morning to be joined by not only an esteemed panel, but the people that I will turn to and continue to turn to across this country as we revisit the importance of policing today and in the 21st century. These are people that um, have touched my life personally and professionally and have touched the lives of men and women across this country who have dedicated their service to the communities in which they live and they work. So now allow me the opportunity to introduce each of them. Joe Brand is the founder and chief executive officer of Joseph Brand and Associates, a consulting firm serving public sector clients with a focus on improving management performance and accountability within policing. From 1994 to 1999, Mr. Brand served as the first director of the Office of Community Oriented Policing within the United States Department of Justice. The COPS Office was the lead federal agency for advancing community policing initiatives for more than 13,000 local and state law enforcement agencies across America. From 1990 to 1995, Joe served as the Chief of Police in the City of Hayward, California, and a Police Captain in the City of Santa Ana. In addition to managing the day-to-day -day operations of his consulting firm, Joe serves on the monitoring teams in the matters of the United States of America versus the County of Los Angeles, and the United States of America versus the City of Cleveland, and in years past, Joe and I served together in the matter of United States of America versus the city of Cincinnati. In addition to those very important initiatives, Joe was involved in a number of other projects aimed at promoting professionalism and accountability and effectiveness in American policing. In my humble opinion, he is a policing icon, and his contributions to our profession are countless. He holds a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Southern California, a Bachelor's of Arts in Criminal Justice from Cal State Fullerton, and is a graduate of the FBI National Academy. Bernadette DePino is the Chief of Police for the City of Sarasota, Florida, where she has served for the past five years. Prior to her appointment, she has served as the Chief of Police in Ocean City, Maryland, and rose to the ranks of that department. Chief DePino comes from a very long line of public servants. Both her grandfather and her father served as police officers in my hometown, the city of Baltimore, Maryland, and her dad is, is uh, a mentor and someone for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect. Her daughter currently serves with the Baltimore County, Maryland Police Department, where Chief B DePino began her law enforcement journey. Chief holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Salisbury State University and is also a graduate of the FBI National Academy. She is very active in the International Association of Chiefs of Police and is presently a candidate for the association's fourth vice president. In my opinion, she's one of the most progressive, forward-thinking police chiefs in America, and we're very fortunate to have her this morning. Rachel Harmon is the FDG Ribble Professor of Law at here at the University of Virginia School of Law. Professor Harmon currently teaches in the area of criminal law, criminal procedure, and civil rights. Her scholarship focuses on policing and its regulation, and her work has appeared in many places, most recently in NYU, Michigan, and Stanford Law Reviews. From 1998 to 2006, Professor Harmon served as a prosecutor at the United States Department of Justice in the Eastern District of Virginia initially, and in the Criminal Division of the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice, where she prosecuted hate crimes and official police misconduct cases. Among her many meaningful efforts across this nation, she currently serves as part of the team of independent monitors in the matter of United States versus the city of Baltimore. Professor Harmon holds a JD from Yale Law School, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and a bachelor's degree from MIT, clearly an underachiever. And we're very fortunate to have Professor Harmon here at, at this great institution, but also as a partner in law enforcement across our nation. Charles Ramsey began his law enforcement career in the city of Chicago in 1968, where he rose to the rank of deputy superintendent, 
retiring from that post in 1998 to assume the duties of Chief of Police in our nation's capital. Chief Ramsey served the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department from 1998 to 2007. And I believe at the time of his retirement from that post, he was the longest serving police chief in the department's history. In November of 2008, he was appointed to serve as the police commissioner in the city of Philadelphia, home of the 2018 Super Bowl champions, the Philadelphia Eagles. Who? <laughs> commissioner Ramsey held that post until 2016. The pleasure of President Obama, he served as a co-chair for the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Commissioner Ramsey serves as the Deputy Monitor in two manners before our federal courts. The United States of America versus the City of Cleveland, and the United States of America versus the City of Baltimore. He holds a Master's and Bachelor's Degree from Lewis University in Illinois, and is a graduate of the FBI National Academy. Commissioner Ramsey is without doubt one of the most respected police leaders in America. Our profession has been made better because of his vision and his many contributions. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here this morning. The way we'll proceed is I've asked each of the panel members to make some brief remarks, about 10 or 15 minutes, talking a little bit about um, their own pers perspectives on community policing, how those perspectives impacted the way they managed and led law enforcement agencies around the country. I've asked Professor Harmon to speak to her scholarly work and achievements with respect to the areas of police reform and that interplay between police reform and community policing, that close intersection. And uh, following their remarks, um, I've prepared some brief questions that I will pose to the panelists, and then we will open it up for each of you to ask as many questions as you deem appropriate. So if we can begin with um, Chief Ram. Okay, there we go. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I think Tim uh, has put together a, a very good panel for a variety of reasons. And Tim shared with us some, some questions, some issues that he asked us to, uh, to think about. Um, and, and some of the questions that, that he had posed to me, let me just state these very briefly. And I'm going to try to touch upon uh, these in the course of my comments, but I want to keep this as succinct as possible, too. Um, Tim had indicated that uh, he felt the audience would be interested in hearing my perspective about why this philosophy of policing, of community policing, is so critical to the, the industry as a whole, and uh, what has happened over the years here from the time of its uh, conception and infusion, and what, what are some of the challenges that have, uh, have been faced by uh, law enforcement executives <coughs> as, as they go about trying to implement uh, the philosophy itself, where has it been most successful and why, how did the COPS office help departments uh, with respect to the uh, development of community policing and problem-oriented policing? And is it still relevant today, in my opinion? And I, I think the way I'd like to come at this is, is uh, to take a moment just to reflect upon uh, where we've been. I think we're all concerned with where we are today. U ultimately, we're always focused on today. But I'd like to take a moment because I think some historical perspective is in order and can be very helpful to understanding this evolution that took place. Uh, I know that all of us can share an abundance of, of uh, examples and stories and anecdotes that we've uh, lived through and gone through in the course of our uh, policing careers uh, and, and dealing with uh, policing issues. Uh, let me just state this very shortly. I would not be in policing, I would not have stayed in policing had it not been for community policing. I reached a point early in my career, as many uh, of my colleagues have as well over the years, I watched a lot of attrition take place. And early on in my career, I came in, uh, Chuck and I both came into policing in the late 60s. Early on in my career, by the early 70s, I was at a stage that I was really questioning whether it's what I wanted to continue to do. I realized that I wasn't uh, seeing what I had hoped to see, and I was experiencing a lot of the same frustrations that most cops do, ultimately. But what kept me in policing was I was fortunate enough to be in an organization with a seminal figure in policing, a chief by the name of Ray Davis, who 
anybody that has been in the industry for years recognized that he was truly one of the founders, the, one of the people that truly, truly helped conceptualize and operationalize the, the uh, philosophy of uh, community policing. That's what kept me in policing for a variety of different reasons. I'm, I'm not going to dwell upon that, but I, I just want to say that I think that it has had untold benefits in attracting and bringing people into the industry, into the profession, that are exactly the kind of people that we want, that we want to uh, help flourish uh, in, in their communities. But going back and looking at, at uh, policing generally, uh, I think it's important to understand that community policing, it, it is not the result of some federal effort. It literally evolved, it occurred at the grassroots level. It evolved because of organizations that were recognizing that something had to change in the industry and the profession, the way that we were doing business. And it sprang up across the country as a result of some very uh, noteworthy uh, police chiefs, sheriffs, law enforcement executives who were recognizing that change had to come about and it, it was truly at a critical time. Prior to that, there have been certain types of movements that have taken place in policing. There was a, a lot of focus in, in the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s on efficiency in, in trying to uh, improve the way that uh, police organizations and public sector organizations in general uh, operated. There was a focus, increasing focus, and evolutions taking place with respect to technology, such things as the development of, of radio cars, uh, uh, equipment, CAD systems, the 911 system. These things took place gradually, incrementally over time, but through the 40s, 50s, 60s, we, we saw some uh, <coughs> significant changes there. A focus on forensics and what could be done there. But if you take a look at all of these uh, trends, they really had to do, by and large, with the internal aspects of policing. It focused more on the organizations, the way that they operated, the way they functioned, where certain types of efficiencies could be improved. And frankly, it was the focus was on reacting to crime, not on prevention, uh, not on trying to work with the public, but reacting to, uh, to crime, responding to crime, trying to make ourselves better in that respect. And it did help, but um, it was all about reacting and investigating. It was not about prevention. It was not about thinking about how we could work more effectively with the community. In the 50s, in the late 50s and 60s, we really began to see the evolution of what was referred to as the community relations movement. And I bring that up because I, I believe that there always has been, there continues to be real confusion about the concepts of community relations and community policing. And they are not one and the same, but frankly, you get better community relations as a result of community policing. Uh, but the community relations movement was more about appeasing, satisfying the public, working with the public from a public relations perspective. It wasn't about changing the way that police did business, it was about making the public believe we were doing a, a good job in trying to uh, appease their interests, their concerns, and their criticisms. But that began the focus on the external uh, aspects of, of policing. So we, we saw these uh, movements continue to take place over time. And then in the 60s and the 70s, uh, a movement towards crime prevention. And this is where the recognition shifted from appeasing the community to, tr finally, to finally trying to engage with the community in some meaningful ways. And it had to do with development of r recognizing we're still responding to crime, we always will respond to crime, but how could the community help us and how could we help the community in that respect and help them from becoming victims? And it had to do with concepts such as target hardening, crime prevention through environmental design, a variety of different public safety programs, working with the business community, but it began to foster and, and fuel a different type of a relationship and engagement. Um, out of that, we began to see the, the early signs, the foundation of the community-oriented policing movement that really began to lay the foundation. That's where I saw the, the, the evolution taking place. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, again, I mentioned I was fortunate enough to be in one of the earliest pioneers of this, this movement. Um, to put it in perspective for you, Santa Ana, California, a city of about 350, 360,000 population, um, had the, the, between 1969 and 1974, it had the fastest increasing part one crime rate in the United States for any city over 100,000 population. By 1976, we had achieved the greatest single year drop in part one crime. And from 1976 up until today, their part one crime rate per capita has continued to decline. And that flies in the face 
of what we've seen nationally, especially throughout the 70s, the 80s, and well into the 90s with the crime rate going up. Now, is that an anomaly? Absolutely it is, but there's a lot of other communities that, that uh, had similar types of experiences too. Uh, what changed there was the way that policing was being done and it was fueled by community policing but it was also driven by the embracing of concepts such as problem-oriented policing and how critical of a role that plays in an organization that is truly committed to community policing. Problem-oriented policing really for those that may not be familiar with it but I'm going to assume that most people have some exposure here uh, to this concept but it really is about thinking differently about crime and disorder issues in the community and recognizing that we can in fact do a better job of uh, first of all understanding what the issues are. The, the basic model is what's referred to as the SARA model, scanning, analysis, response, and assessment. And using those four key steps to think critically and, and in a very sharp and focused way about the types of uh, recurring issues that we're dealing with in a community that consume so much of our time and energy. Um, I could go on and on about this. Again, I'm going to keep this, this short because uh, I, I think it's really important that we get to your questions ultimately. But uh, crime and social disorder are the focus of community policing. It's not just crime. It's social disorder. It's those issues that affect the quality of life of people in a community. Um, one of the questions that Tim had posed here was examples of cities where this has been done and done well. And let me state this, that even in the most successful cities, there are, there are failures, there are shortcomings. Um, but some of the cities that come to my mind readily when I think back about the early days of the movement, Santa Ana, obviously, because of my experiences there. Um, and that's because of my experiences there. That's why I was asked to go to, to Hayward, California, as the police chief there. But other cities that, that jump out in my mind, um, San Diego, because they had a very, very strong focus on problem-oriented policing. Portland, Oregon, Madison, Wisconsin, Newport News, Virginia, Tucson, Arizona. And some of these cities, there's been a waxing and waning over time. And that's to be uh, understood and recognized that that can and will happen. Uh, why does it occur? I think for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the questions Tim posed had to do with what are some of the challenges that law enforcement executives encounter in the course of, of uh, trying to move forward with this. Let me state up front that I think one of the biggest challenges and something that oftentimes get in the w gets in the way, and especially in the early days, is that there's a failure to recognize what it takes to sustain this. Conceptually, philosophically, we may appreciate it, but it requires some wholesale, fundamental, major changes in the way that we operationalize, uh, the way that we carry out business in our law enforcement organizations. It requires a different type of a management structure, a different way of thinking. And put it in context very briefly, um, a lot of times our organizational systems have been developed to achieve a particular outcome. But those outcomes, those, that focus, is something that really is rooted in tradition and in history. And we don't think about how our, our organizational systems actually get in the way of what we're trying to do in, the, in terms of changing our focus and, our, and how we're going to devote our, our time and our energy. A good example of that would be uh, personnel systems. Uh, you've got to recruit for a different type of a person. Your training has to shift. Uh, historically, we're very, very focused on, on activity. We're not sufficiently focused on outcomes. And that's what community policing is really all about. It's not about how many crimes uh, that are occurring. It's not about uh, how many arrests are made. It's, it's not about our response time. Those are all measures and, and different types of metrics. But by and large, most police metrics are built around activity, not outcomes, activities. Arrests, citations, uh, field interviews, uh, enforcement types of activities, but in many instances there's not a direct correlation between those activity and the outcome that we're seeking. And if we're seeking an improved quality of life and a reduction in crime, we ought to be measuring those. But that, that's not necessarily the metrics that are used. Hence, there's a need to focus on these organizational systems and ask ourselves, are we measuring what's, what matters? Have we built the organizational capacity to do the types of things that we say that we're doing? That in turn requires some uh, long-term change and, and thinking in our behavior and uh, the, the way that we conduct ourselves. Um, it's a challenge, it's a challenge for chiefs, and if you haven't lived it at the line level, 
uh, it's going to be even more difficult. And I came to a realization back in the 70s, I was thinking early on because of what was happening in Santa Ana, this was going to sweep the country. It was literally going to have a profound influence on the way policing was done. But what I found after about eight or ten years, I started reflecting on this and seeing that there was, there was movement, but it was incremental in nature. And I finally came to the realization that the future of community policing rested with those who were coming up in organizations that were doing this because they would understand it from the ground up and they would have a better ability as they became the future leaders to embrace this and move forward with it. And that has proven to be true. Uh, let me come back around to one of the last questions which had to do with uh, the role of the cops office. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked by uh, Janet Reno and Bill Clinton to come to, to Washington to create the cops office. And uh, it may s sound a little strange, but initially I said no. And the reason I said no is because what was known at that time is that the cops office was going to be adding 100,000 police officers. That was the a primary objective, to add 100,000 police officers across the country. And I told, in a meeting I had with Janet Reno, I told her, I said, if this is simply about adding 100,000 cops, it's a waste of money. Uh, because we've been adding cops for decades. And our crime rate is continuing to uh, uh, just completely uh, blow out of control. But if we're going to change the way that, that policing is done, uh, then it, it, this would be worth considering. And, and she assured me, as the White House did, that this is really about trying to fundamentally help support the community policing movement. And uh, I did believe then I agreed to do this, to step into that role, because I, I believe that there was a lot that we could do. But it was not really going to come about because of, of hiring or redeploying police officers. It was really going to come about because of training, supporting, uh, and helping agencies embrace the, the concept. My biggest concern, because I'd also lived through major changes under the uh, old Law Enforcement Assistance Administration back in the 60s and the 70s, is that a lot of agencies would be chasing the dollars for the sake of chasing the money. It wasn't really about changing the way that they were doing business, and we needed to accept that. We need to acknowledge and understand that that was going to occur. And trust me, it did. Now, we had uh, $10 billion to administer to, to support community policing. We met the objectives of, of hiring and redeploying 100,000 police officers under budget and ahead of time. Um, there's a lot of money, to, to be perfectly honest, that I think was uh, not well spent. There were agencies that jumped on it for the purpose of getting additional personnel for a period of time, but they weren't uh, interested in sustaining that. There were plenty of other agencies, though, that did, and I think the, the whole uh, concept behind the cops office was fruitful in that it helped ad advance the agenda, but we still have a long ways to go. I personally will welcome the day that we can quit referring to drawing this distinction between community policing and policing. To me, they're one and the same. They, they always should have been. Um, but we did need to, to draw that distinction early on to <coughs> recognize, to acknowledge that what we were doing was not consistent with what the concepts, the principles of policing are all about. And let me just close by stating this. How many of you are familiar with uh, Sir Robert Peel? Just by a show of hands. Uh, there's a fair number of people. Um, Sir Robert Peel was, is, is renowned as the father of policing. Uh, he was the creator of the uh, 1829 Metropolitan Police Act in London, which is really uh, recognized as, as the, where the concept of policing as we know it today came from. But he articulated nine principles of policing um, in almost 200 years ago now that are as true today as they were then. In fact, in many respects, I think they're even more true today. A lot of people that are familiar with uh, Peel's work can oftentimes cite his seventh principle, but there's nine altogether, and I think all, all nine are equally important. I'm not going to sit here and read to you all of those, but the seventh one has to do with this, to maintain at all times a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police the police being only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention and duties which are incumbent on every citizen in the interest of community welfare and existence. And I don't think there's a person in this room that would disagree with that. But I think it's equally important to recognize that the other principles that he articulated are so critically important to, uh, today and we need to spend more time as an industry, as a profession, 
um, understanding and acknowledging those. And just a couple of them very briefly. The first one, to prevent crime and disorder as an alternative to their repression by military force and severity of legal punishment. It's a very interesting concept, but, but uh, one that should drive the way that we conduct ourselves in, in uh, policing. To recognize always that the power of the police to fulfill their functions and duties is dependent upon public approval of their existence, actions, and behavior, and on their ability to secure and maintain public interest. See the theme that's beginning to evolve in this? It's the recognition about the, the, the critical role between police and the public, and you cannot do it uh, w without public engagement, public support, and public confidence. Um, let me get, uh, just skip over these and go down to the last one, because I think it really gets back to what we ought to be focused on. To recognize always that the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder and not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with them. And we are very, very good as an industry in showing you how busy we are. We can continue to do that. Uh, but it isn't about how busy we are. It really needs to be about how effective we are and are we achieving the right outcomes. So let me just close in saying that, um, uh, again, I think what's most important is that we recognize that this is what policing always should have been about. I believe in the last, uh, I've been in this industry in and around it now for almost 50 years, and uh, it's fascinating to me to take a look. Sometimes that's the benefit of age, is you've, you've got a little bit uh, better perspective and, and uh, uh, can put things into a certain context or, or perspective that helps you appreciate where you've been. I think that there's been tremendous growth in the industry. I'm very proud of what we've done as a profession, but I still think that we've got a long ways to go, and community policing is the avenue to get us there, too. Thank you. Joe, thank you very much for, <clears throat> for sharing your thoughts. I hope you don't mind that I've called you chief. That's a lifetime That's appointment. That's it goes. <laughs> and it's certainly something that you've earned. I, I have no particular order here, but I'm, I, I'm drawn to hearing from, from Chief DePino, not necessarily in response to Joe, Joe's remarks, but, but as someone who's a sitting police chief in a very progressive community in Florida, um, among the other questions I've asked, kind of talk about why this whole notion of community policing is is still relevant and perhaps why it's most relevant today than it's ever been before. Well, thank you to me so much for uh, this opportunity. I'm honored to be here before all of you today and sitting with this esteemed panel. I, um, uh, I Again, it's a great honor to be sitting with everyone and, and have a chance to talk with you about something that's really near and dear to my heart, which is community policing. And I, I agree, there's got to come a time where you just don't call it community policing, it's just policing. I just want to tell you a little history on how I even got involved with community policing, and it was 1995, and I was sitting first on the sergeant's list in Ocean City, Maryland. I wanted to be a sergeant bad. See, I wanted to be a sergeant because, see, my dad was a major that retired from Baltimore City, and my grandfather was a captain from uh, Baltimore City, and my great-grandfather was also a police officer. So when my dad became a police officer, his dad said to him, you have to retire one rank higher than me. So, of course, my dad became a major, and then guess what my dad said to me? you have to be one rank higher than me before you retire. And he's like, oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to be a major. So he did. And I had, I'm like, what am I going to do to be the major? And I had to become police chief, which I ultimately did. And uh, my dad and grandfather were both there. So I wanted to fast track it as quickly as I could because I had a family tradition, you know, I had to keep up. So now my daughter's a police officer in Baltimore County. You know what I've told her? You've got to be one rank higher than me. And she's like, how do I be police chief? I'm like, I don't know, director of Homeland Security, maybe FBI director, you know. So she's got to get working. So I was first on this sergeant's test, and I didn't care where my chief put me. I didn't care. And he pulled me in the office one day, said, congratulations, I am putting you in charge of this brand new unit called the Community Policing Unit. He could have told me I was standing at the inlet counting boats coming in and out, and I'd be, yes, sir, I've got this, I'll take care of it. And then I thought about it, I'm like, community policing? I what's community policing? He goes, don't worry, I'll send you to a school. So typical cop, I'm in the classroom, in the back, where all good cops sit in the back of the classroom, and the instructor gets up, he says, um, for the next three days, we're gonna teach you about community policing. Let me ask you this now, how many of you think community policing is this touchy-feely, let's be nice to the public, and we all raised our hands. And how, he says, well, how many of you think that this is really a waste of time? We all looked at each other, we all raised our hands. And uh, he said, well, just give, me, just give me a little bit of time, and I think I'll convince you differently. 
30 minutes later, he had me. He had me because what he talked about were things about problem solving, developing relationships with people within the community. He went on and on, and I was like, okay, I do that. I've been doing that. I, I've done that my whole career. As a rookie officer in Baltimore County, I ride around at, in Dundalk, if any of you are familiar with it, very nice area in, in uh, East Baltimore. And uh, I'm Italian, so I like to talk to people. And I'm in the car by myself. I was like, okay, I got to get out of this car and go walk into a store. And I walked into this sub shop, and the business owner was, what's the matter? Is there something wrong? I'm like, no, I'm just stopping in to say hi and introduce myself. I'm working this area. He goes, oh, geez, I thought something was wrong. I've never had a cop come into my store before. And I thought, wow, that's really weird. And I developed a relationship with him. And he would give me information about who the good guys were, who the bad guys were. He actually helped me solve certain crimes within the community. So I learned from that. And I really learned from my dad and my grandfather. See, my grandfather was a cop during the time when just around the end of World War II and all the sailors were coming into Baltimore City down to, I know, some areas that, uh, that Timmy knows very well. Um, uh, they had the horse you rode in on and some of the other bars down on Broadway. And uh, so the sailors would come... Well, he worked He worked that area. He didn't hang in those there. He just worked that area. <clears throat> so my grandfather would be patrolling the area where all these sailors were hanging out, having a good time as sailors would. And uh, my grandfather was a big guy. He, his hands were so big. But even being a big guy, you can still, if you're in a fight, you need backup. And my grandfather was walking a beat by himself, so he had to depend on the people in the community, the bar owners, the citizens, to either, one, jump in and help him, or to call at least for a squad car to come and back him up. No matter how big and bad he was, he still needed the community. And he was involved with the community to the point where they would come to him and say, hey, Mr. Jim, can you come and coach my, uh, my son in reading because he's not doing very well in school or I'm really, really worried about the kids he's hanging down. So my grandfather was much more than a law enforcement officer. He would, he would do a lot of things from, you know, uh, giving birth to babies in the community to, you know, coaching kids on how to read. So I learned that philosophy that was passed down to my dad, um, who was then passed on to me, and now my daughter is doing the same exact thing. It's, and I think part of it has to do with a, a love of people and caring about people. The reason why I took this job as a police officer is because I wanted to help people. I want to make their life better. And I also have this philosophy that we can't so – first of all, we're not going to solve crime problems. Hey, yay, job security. Wow, that's good. But the thing is, is we can impact people's lives one person at a time. And that's what I love about problem solving is because it's individualized. It's specific towards a specific crime or support to a specific area or even to a specific house. And so that's how I got involved with community policing. Very quickly talked myself out of a job as a sergeant of the community policing unit because – Anyone that knows anything about community policing knows it needs to be a department-wide philosophy, not just a unit. And I had a unit, and I had a cool unit, the mounted unit and the bike unit. But everybody was jealous. The officers were jealous of the unit. The community didn't understand that they could talk to any officer. They wanted to talk to the community policing unit, and, and I changed that within our department. And I knew I could lose my stripes, but I decided to, to do that to, the, um, uh, to my chief, told him we, we can't do it. He says, what would you do? So we need to teach everybody, from the records clerk all the way up to the chief of police, how to participate in community policing. And uh, we did a lot of cool problem solving in Ocean City. Anybody that's ever been there knows it's a resort town on the East Coast. We get eight, got 8 million visitors a year. Um, but we were really ambassadors. And we had to learn that it really wasn't about arresting everybody. It was really about how do we encourage people to um, not break the law, keep the crime rate down because people needed to feel safe coming to a resort town. Um, so we did some problem solving, things like we lined up buses in front of the bars um, at the end of the night because the bars, after they emptied, they were going to the bus stops and they were all fighting and we would respond and officers were in, in the middle of fights, which we called signal 13s, and they were out in the middle of the, the bus stop and officers are getting hurt and I said, we, we gotta do something different here. So I stole an idea from Baltimore County which they were having problems at a skate club, and they lined up buses at the skate club. The kids got on the buses and took them home, and I did that in Ocean City. Lined up buses, put police officers on the bus, and they'll never forget the first night the officers were uh, singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat with all the drunks on the bus as it went riding up the, the highway, and it, and it worked. Um, and we didn't have to arrest people, and people felt safe, and uh, that's part of what community policing is, is making people feel safe, preventing crime from happening, Probably the biggest challenge that I have as a chief 
is educating officers as to truly what community policing is um, because they think it is just being nice to the community. They don't realize that it's so much more than that. Um, in trying to educate our officers that community policing is actually a safer way of policing. Um, the better relationship you have with the community, the more likely they are going to be there to defend you, whether it's physically or also morally. When, when you get into trouble, they're like, oh, I know Bernadette. Yeah, she's a nice person. There's got to be more to that story than I read on the, on the news today. I, maybe I'm not getting the whole story. They, they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, but I think the big challenge with community policing is how do we capture data to say, wow, you prevented 50 crimes right now just by your actions. You can't. It's like going up to a bad guy and saying, you were going to rob that 7-Eleven if that police officer wasn't sitting over the cross there, weren't you? How do you capture that data? And we're so driven on data and numbers, and it's not our fault. I'm going to tell you right up front as police chiefs, it's not our fault. We have to have those numbers in order to make budgets. Um, uh, because if we don't show what our justification for needing more police officers and more cars and more bullets and all that stuff, how do we get the commissions or councils or our bosses to, to fund us the money that we need? Because you can't just say, well, we're preventing crime. Well, show me. Show me. So we have to do a better job of actually, one, capturing the, the rewards of community policing, two, also recognizing police officers that do a good job for community policing. So we got an awful lot of awards for, yes, that's the highest producing police officer, and they made this many arrests and this many tickets, and we, as a matter of fact, I got rid of statistical data in our police department. I don't track that individually by police officers because I knew as a police officer, that's what I was being evaluated on. Oh, they want to know how many arrests I made. I got to go make arrests. Uh, they want to know how many tickets I wrote because they're keeping that down. They're keeping track of it. So we have to change how we're capturing what our police officers do and give them awards for uh, the good community policing efforts that they're making, the problem solving. And, uh, and part of the thing that I'm trying to do and we've been doing in Sarasota is getting away from arrest-driven policing now listen, we're always going to be arresting people. We're always going to be writing tickets. That's part of our job. We're law enforcement. But we have to be smart about what we're doing. And I'll give you an example. Um, in Sarasota, I first got there, and we were having problems with prostitutes on the North Trail. My first job was to, to get the officers to stop calling the women girls. That was my first um, uh, goal. Still working on that, by the way. Um, <laughs> But I can tell you we have reduced prostitution on the North Trail. Um, but when I first got there, the, the legislature was talking about, okay, we're going to give a $5,000 fine for all the Johns that we capture trying to pick up women on the North Trail. I'm like, yes, awesome. That's a good deterrent. It's, you know, it's almost like um, economics. You know, you got supply and demand. If you don't have the person paying, they aren't going to have the demand. And the legislature said, oh, that's too, too stiff of a penalty to pay, for men to pay $5,000. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. If a woman's picked up for prostitution three times, she's a felon for the rest of her life. How is that fair? I said, okay, we got to change things. Challenged our um, shift. I said, I'm giving you this problem. Give me the solution. I could have done it. I'm a chief. I don't have time for that. Go give me the solution. They came back and said, we want to meet with you, chief. Here's our idea. We want to do this program. We called it Turn Your Life Around Tyla. We partnered with some um, civic organizations. And instead of arresting the women for prostitution, when we caught them in prostitution, we gave them an alternative. They went into a program with Sale of Freedom, which is a nationally renowned organization that helps with human trafficking. Because anybody that knows anything about prostitution is most of the women are there are being trafficked. And uh, they're runaways. They're uh, misled. They were in domestic violence situations. So I could go on and on about it. But we partnered with them. Guess what? We've been able to reduce prostitution. We've been able to help women get off of the streets, and we haven't had to arrest a whole lot of the women. And our North Trail is being cleaned up. It's not totally gone. Again, job security, but it's we still have came we came up with an alternative solution. The drugs. Drugs are one of the to me one of the number one problems we're facing in our communities, and all crimes relate to drugs burglaries, robberies, thefts, um, homicides, most of them are drug related. Um, so what do we do? Do we arrest everybody that's involved with drugs? Um, some people are addicted, some people do it for economic reasons, they have no other alternatives. We came up with a solution. We stole um, uh, the idea from High Point, North Carolina, and uh, we called DMI, Drug Market Intervention. Again, problem solving. Instead of arresting all of the bad guys, now that doesn't mean the bad guys don't go to jail. We got some really bad, bad, bad 
criminals. They go to jail and they get their major time. But a lot of the people um, uh, that you look at, you have to look at, are they, is it a first time offense? Are they not a violent offender? Let's give them a chance and have the community embrace them. And that's part of community policing is you get the community involved. Getting the community involved makes it safer, as I said to you, for police officers. Um, uh, it also builds up trust with law enforcement because they get to know you. Police are tough. The police in this room will probably tell the same thing. We're a little bit paranoid, and rightly so. Uh, a lot of what we do is dangerous, but not everybody is out actually trying to kill us. Not everybody. There's a few, but not everybody. So how do you get police officers to balance safety with still doing a job and not um, uh, pushing you know citizens away and as you heard I mean the, the invention of the police car was probably the worst thing that could ever happen to police community relations because we can put the windows up now and turn the music on and the air conditioning we don't have to hear you as we're driving by um, whereas again my dad's time and even in my time in Ocean City I walked a boardwalk I didn't have a choice but to be this close to the next person next to me and engage with them it taught me a lot about how to communicate with people and how to be involved with citizens and build up relationships and trust. And, um, and we need that in our communities. That's what's going to change um, a lot of what's going on in our communities. That's why some of the communities, and, and I'm not going to be critical, specifically critical, but what was really important when I first got to Sarasota was building a relationship with people in the community that felt alienated from the police. And, um, and it was tough, it was really tough. Um, we have a minority community called uh, Newtown in Sarasota, and it was a definitive us against the police. And the funny thing is, is that there was such a small percentage of the criminals um, lived in Newtown, 97 or higher percentage of the people that lived in the community were good law-abiding citizens, but guess who they, they felt prey to law enforcement who felt like, I have to save this community, so in order to save the community, I have to pull over every single person in the community, I have to stop them for not wearing a seatbelt or having a tail light out or having a license plate that uh, can't be read. And, and uh, I said, you're, ended, you're shooting um, a, a shotgun in the middle of a, a barrel of fish and you're hitting all these innocent fish that are swimming around with these these criminals, you know who the criminals are, target the criminals, stop targeting the people in the community because you're alienating the people that you think you're trying to protect. And that's the biggest challenge in law enforcement for me right now is how do we enforce the laws but not alienate the people that we were sworn to look after. And I tell our officers, you gotta be, you seen the Andy Griffin, you seen you know, uh, the Andy Griffin show, Mayberry, that's the type of police we need to be. He didn't walk around with a gun, although I, I'm not saying we shouldn't walk around with guns, um, but he walked around in the community and he knew everybody and everybody knew him. He was able to ask people to walk themselves into jail. Yeah, do we have Mayberries left? Yeah, I think we do. We have a lot of Mayberries left. And we just have to get our officers to recognize that and get our community to recognize that we're in this together. That's what I loved about community policing. That's why I embraced it so much, is that it's not just my responsibility to fight crime anymore, it's our responsibility. We have to work on this together as police and citizens. And, um, and I learned lessons along the way. Um, one story that helped me to become who I am right now is a, a police officer on vacation in Florida, of all places, and I was lost in Miami with my daughter. And um, I was in a bad area. You all know the bad areas. You just get the bad feeling in the back of your neck and I'm riding down the road and I'm like, oh dear God, please help get me out of this safely. And something told me to make a right hand turn and there was a police car and I'm like, hey God, you act fast. Thank you very much as a police officer. Because when you see a police officer, what should you think? I've got help there. Somebody is gonna take care of me. This is good. So I pull up and uh, he's talking to a partner. I'm like, oh, not just one, it's two cops. Yes, God, you're good. So I look and I, I wave and I, I can't get his attention, which is not really safe. Um, so I decided to tap on the window, which I didn't want to do because I didn't want to scare him, but I'm like, I have no other choice. So I tap on the window and he turns and he looks at me and he doesn't put the window down. I'm like, are you kidding? So I'm like, can you wind the window down? Now this is old school for though. This is how windows used to go down like this. I don't know if he would have recognized that, but so, so I'm like, can you wind your window down? So he winds the window down and he says, what? just like that, and I was like, oh my, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I, I apologize, I, 
I don't mean to bother you, but in my head, I was saying something that I'd heard people say to, to police officers before, and I wanted to say to him is, I pay your salary. You should be helping me right now. But I didn't want to say that because I didn't want to get him upset, didn't want to get him angry. I'm like, I'm so sorry to bother you. I said, but I'm lost. Can you help me get to the Jackie Gleason Convention Center? Uh, my daughter and I are going to see a show. And he looks over at his partner, shaked his head like, look how stupid she is. She deserves to get mugged down here. Now, he didn't say that, but he was thinking it. I know he was thinking it. At least in my mind, he was thinking it. So I'm like, oh, time to pull out the badge. So I pull out my badge. I'm like, hey, um, I'm on the job. I'm a sergeant up in Ocean City, Maryland. Could you give me some professional courtesy? And, and, and I was like really kind of shocked. I even had to pull the badge out. But I'm like, can you help me? He goes, go up, make the first left and the second right. And he put his window up. And as I pulled away, I knew a couple of things. First, I knew he lied to me. I knew that wasn't the right directions, and he didn't. He didn't give me right directions, but luckily I used my own sense and found the way. Second, I was mad at myself that I did not get his name. I should have gotten his name and reported him to a supervisor because that was not the proper way to treat anybody in the community. And third was that when I was chief one day, yes, I know it sounds cocky, but I, I had to beat my dad. You know, I had to be more than a major. But when I was chief one day, I was going to make sure my officers never did that to a citizen in the community. Not because it's community policing, not because of any, but it's the right thing to do. We are here as servants. We are public servants. And uh, when I went back as a sergeant, I couldn't control the whole department, but I certainly could control my squad. And I made sure my squad treated everybody with dignity and respect. And I told them, you treat everybody the way you want your mother to be treated the way you want your sister to be treated. You, you Don't think that you've been asked 500 times where to park in Ocean City. That's the first encounter they have with you as a police officer. And they're gonna judge you. If that was the only police officer that I'd ever met in my whole life, I would think all cops were jerks. Luckily I hadn't. I met good police officers like Timmy Longo and my dad and other police officers that lived honorable careers. So I knew there were good police officers, but if that was the only cop I'd ever met, they're all jerks. Um, I said, you have an opportunity, and it may not impact you, but it's going to impact other police officers. You keep that badge shiny, and you may help another officer not get involved in a fight, not get hurt. So that's why community policing, this being engaged with your community, keeps police officers safe. Um, and then when I got promoted to lieutenant, I made sure my whole division uh, practiced that. And then I was made chief of police in Ocean City. And... Uh, and my dad and grandfather were both there, and my grandfather elbowed my dad and said, son, she beat us both. But he said it with much pride. He was very, uh, very happy. And I made sure that organization did the same thing, that we treat people the way we want to be treated, no matter whether you're the, the most heinous criminal in the world to the um, uh, person that's reporting a crime and every victim and everybody in between. We need to treat people as human beings because it's not up to me to determine how a person's treated um, uh, once they commit a crime, except for with dignity and respect. Because that could be my sister, it could be a family relative, it could be, it is somebody's family relative, it is somebody's sister and brother, and we have an obligation um, to do the right thing. So that's part of what community policing is, that's part of the philosophies that I have brought into the organizations, but it's a challenge. Um, the Sarasota, when I got there, they're like, we already know about community policing. Yeah, we've been practicing that for years. I'm like, oh, I don't know if you have. Um, let's see. And they did things like reading with kids after school and being involved in activities with Boys and Girls Club and everything, but they really weren't doing the problem solving. They weren't engaging with the community and humanizing themselves. And it wasn't until one of our officers was um, uh, making an arrest on a drug deal and the community surrounded him, and I responded to the scene, and I was shocked. Um, and I went door to door. I went to every person on that block, and I, I said, I want to know why you um, surrounded my police officer, our police officer. Why did you surround them? And they're like, it wasn't me. I, I'm scared to death to live in this community. And every single house that I went to, except for one, by the way, happened to be the drug dealer's house, were all good law-abiding citizens who were trapped up in this drug dealer's world. They locked their doors, they were scared to come out at night, typical story we hear, and I promised them that we would be back. So we threw a community picnic. You would have thought that I was asking our officers to give up their pension. You would have thought the community, um, they were like, you're feeding drug dealers, you're gonna, I can't believe you're having a picnic. And I was like, oh, please let this work. I knew it was going to, um, but we threw a community day and I got the police there and the community there, the, everybody was critical. The newspaper was critical, the community was critical. They, like, everybody was critical of this. But it was really a defining moment for our department. So we have this event and 
people came out of their houses and the officers got pictures with the people and people were crying and one citizen came up and said, this woman hasn't been out of her house for 20 years. We painted the mailboxes and put flowers around. We did all the things you do with uh, community policing. And I promised them in the community at the end, I had a microphone, I said, I promise you, we're, the drug dealers, we're going after you. We're not going to allow you to take over this, this community. And, uh, and God was with me because 30 days later, we, uh, we were working on a wiretap and we were able to hit a bunch of the drug dealers. We got like 16 kilos, all kinds of drugs, guns, everything. And, uh, and the community is like, she told you. She told you she was coming to get you. It was that only by luck. Any of you that works in, in uh, law enforcement know sometimes it's a little luck. We had a little luck. But that event in and of itself changed how the community saw us. That event changed how the police saw the community. We still have a ways to go. Um, but I'm really proud of the efforts that we're making. And, and it's a team. It's not just the police. It's the community. And you have a bigger role. The community has a much bigger role than the police have in uh, in this, but it's up to us to, to, to lead the way. Um, I could probably tell you a million other stories, but I've got to turn it over. Uh, thank you, Timmy, for this opportunity. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Chief. Appreciate your comments and your contributions. Commissioner Ramsey, uh, you've served in some of the largest police agencies in this country. Um, we're interested in hearing your perspective on this. What, what are some of the greatest challenges we're facing as we embark in the 21st century of policing? Thanks, Tim, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I want to start off by uh, just uh, making it very clear, uh, I'm not as old as Joe Brand. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Even though we started uh, around the same time. Um, what I want to do is to talk from um, a bit of a different perspective. Um, I have served in, in large departments, um, started my career in Chicago. I'm a native Chicagoan. I uh, grew up on the south side of Chicago. I'm no stranger to uh, uh, living in an area that's uh, challenged. I grew up in a community called Inglewood on the south side of Chicago, which if you know anything about Chicago at all, that, that is one of the more challenging areas um, of the city. Um, I had the honor of working in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital in the late 90s, which Washington was certainly uh, challenged, and of course now uh, Philadelphia. Um, so um, I'm very familiar with working in, in large cities and very troubled uh, agencies. I am a huge believer in um, community policing. I'm not nearly as progressive as Joe. It didn't strike me until the 90s that this was the way to go. I mean, in the, the 1970s and, and 80s, you know, I was uh, the fairly young cop who, you know, uh, you know, arresting people and doing the things like that was really policing. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least that was the culture of the Chicago Police Department. Uh, but my, my, my perspective has changed over the years. And as Joe said, you know, it does some of that is just age related. But it's also the experiences that I've had. In uh, 2014, right around Thanksgiving, I got a call from the uh, White House, which doesn't happen every day, obviously. And um, President Obama was, going, was thinking about um, creating a task force to take a look at 21st century policing and wanted me to uh, co-chair that effort, which is quite an honor, and obviously I accept it. Um, he then chose the remaining members uh, of the team. Uh, my co-chair, Lori Robinson, uh, of course, is someone who I had worked with before. Uh, and I was very pleased that uh, she would be the co-chair uh, in working through this effort. Uh, but the remaining members were all chosen uh, by the White House. And because we were talking about pretty high profile people with busy schedules, uh, we weren't able to have our first meeting until January uh, 17th of 2015. The president wanted a draft on his desk March the 2nd. Now that's not a lot of time to put together any kind of meaningful uh, report. So we had to get to work pretty quickly and really focus on this. We came up in six areas that we were gonna focus on and we called them pillars. Uh, the only two that really we gave any thought to having um, uh, in, uh, positioned was the first, which was building trust and legitimacy, and the very last one, which was 
officer safety and wellness. If we had had more time, we would have dealt with issues like recruitment and hiring, leadership development, and so forth. But you can, you know, we had a very compressed time frame. So we came up with six areas that we thought would be important. I don't. I'm not going to cover all those areas, obviously, but I do want to touch on two. First is building trust and legitimacy. Now, you've heard from uh, from from Joe and and Bernadette. I mean, community policing, at least the the concept of community policing, has been around a long time. So the 1970s at least, and really the 1980s is when most departments started really understanding what it was and tried to, in their own way, implement something like that, or at least say they were implementing something like that. But think about that for a minute. In 2015, when we were given this assignment, we felt, all of us collectively, that building trust and legitimacy ought to be the very first pillar that we address, because without that, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. Nothing else can happen. So you have to ask yourself, if community policing's been around since the 1970s, why is it in 2015, we felt that building trust and legitimacy had to be the foundation for everything else that we talked about? And if you think about 2013, 14, uh, 15, Policing was under siege. Um, I said it earlier to, uh, to Rachel, you know, if I ever uh, personally encountered President Trump, I would have to thank him because he took us off the front page. <laughs> you stop and think about it, prior to his election, it was all about policing, these viral videos, all the things that were going on, right? That was it. I mean, we were getting hit from all angles. So something wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't catching. I mean, this whole concept, this philosophy, even though it, it started to take root, but it really wasn't where it needed to be because, you know, we, we, we were missing something. Now, I have my own opinions and own views on what that something is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. But reality is that in many communities, we never had trust. We were never looked at as being legitimate. The, uh, the story that Bernadette just told about the rude police officer in Miami is a daily reality for some people in some of our cities. That's just a fact, folks. And we have to come to grips with the fact that in order for a concept like community policing to really take hold, we got to go beyond creating the, the directives, the, creating the policy, the training, and all that. We have to reach the hearts and minds of officers. We have to make that transition from community policing discussions as if it was something separate and apart from just policing. How do you, how do you make that transition? What do we have to do so that officers have this instinctive feel for what they ought to be doing and how they ought to be treating the communities, and in particular, the most challenged communities, because that's where we're needed the most, yet we're respected the least. And so I think when I was in Chicago, and I, I was the first project manager to try to create a, uh, a community policing program for that department, which Chicago um, is a very traditional department. It's very large. It's second only to New York City in terms of size, around 14,000 sworn um, members of the department. So it was no easy task. Um, and I remember we, we started our training, and, and it was, uh, was kind of gray. I mean, it was uh, a lot of philosophy and, and theory and all that sort of thing. And I never forget, uh, during after uh, the break of one of the training sessions, a cop came up to me and he said, uh, he said, Chief, he said, I was a deputy chief at the time, he said, Chief, he said, uh, this is great uh, training, really appreciate it. We had a different venue. We went out to, you know, the South Shore Country Club on the lakefront and all that to, you know, get away from the academy and all that sort of thing. He said, this is really nice. I really appreciate it. He said, but why don't you just try telling us what it is you want us to do? <laughs> I never forgot that. And so from that point on, we started to really focus on what's different. When they start their tour of duty, what is it that we want them to do now that's different from what they did the day before? 
And I think that had a lot to do with the success that we had in trying to implement community policing. But it didn't go far enough, and it wasn't until I went to Washington, D.C. as police chief in 1998, and you're a new chief in a, a city that you're not from in particular. You get all kinds of invitations, letters, everybody wants to meet you, talk to you. Well, one letter came from the Anti-Defamation League, an individual, David Friedman, who was the executive director of ADL in D.C., who has since become a very, very good friend, but I didn't know him from Adam at the time. And he sent me uh, an invitation to uh, visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And so, okay, we put it on the schedule. And at the time, I was flying back and forth to Chicago because my family had not yet moved to D.C. for a couple of reasons. One, my son was still in elementary school, had all his buddies playing football. We wanted to make sure he could finish out without uprooting it. And second is, that's my first chief's job, and I had no idea if I'd even survive as a chief. No <laughs> point in moving my family and then I get fired. Uh, so I was going back and forth. But I went to the museum <clears throat> not expecting anything in particular. I wasn't a particularly good student in high school uh, and history was not my favorite subject even though now I can't get enough of it. Um, but we didn't, they didn't talk about the Holocaust uh, when I went through school in the 1960s. They mentioned it but they didn't really get into any of the detail. They talked about World War II, but they didn't really talk about the Holocaust. And so I went through the museum, and if you've ever been there, it was, a, the, it was overwhelming. It was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. And I think it was made that way because there was a woman by the name of Irene Weiss who was an actual survivor. And as we walked through the muse museum, she was right there with me, and she's telling me her own story, her family's story as we're going through uh, the museum. And when it was over, there was something that really bothered me. It was, it was haunting, and I didn't quite know what it was. I got on my plane, I went to Chicago, and about a week later, I went to the museum, again, unannounced, because I wanted to take my time and go through it. And it didn't take long before I realized what was bothering me, and that was the images that I saw were all not just Nazi soldiers, but also police officers. Mm -hmm. They were a part of what took place. And it made me think, um, Germany had been a democratic society prior to the rise of Hitler. So what happened? How could police officers that took an oath very similar to, to the one that I took, how could they go from that to being part of death squads and, and all that sort of thing? And at the time we were giving this training as the, one of the uh, many efforts that we've had in trying to reach members. It was called sensitivity training, uh, um, uh, a, a term that I absolutely hate because it implies everyone's insensitive. And when you, when, when you go into the training, you know, cops are sitting there with their arms folded, white cops over here, black cops over there. And I mean, it, we, it, nobody's listening, nobody's paying attention, right? And so I thought about it. And I said, you know, the one thing we don't talk about is the role of police in a democratic society. What is that? And when you read the oath that we take as police officers in practically every city, I would imagine all of them, but I don't know for sure, that part of that oath involves swearing that we will protect the constitutional rights of all people. Now, if you ask the average police officer what's the role of police in our society, they'll no doubt say law enforcement. But how many of them will say that part of their, that, that their role is to protect the constitutional rights of all people? And what the Holocaust shows is what happens when police officers lose sight of that very important role that they play and how fast it can go downhill, that you become something as, as sinister as something that happened there. Now, I'm not calling cops Nazis or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. It's a larger discussion, I think, that needs to be had, and that is what is the role of police in a democratic society. You go through the police academy, whether you go through in, in the late 60s like I did or you go through now. We're very good at teaching people the technical aspects of policing. How do you make out this report? How do you handcuff a suspect? How do you do this? How do you do that? How much time do we spend actually talking about the role of police in society? We, we, we touch on the Constitution as it, as it affects policing, certain amendments of the Constitution, but we don't go into any real depth. The other area we don't really talk about is power and authority. 
which I think is critically important. How do you manage that? How do you really get an understanding of it? You get 20, 21, 22-year-old men and women. You put them through the academy. You give them a badge and a gun. You put them in a car that uh, drives very fast with lights and sirens, and then you wonder why things go bad. We don't spend time thinking about the responsibility that you have the minute you raise your hand and you take that oath and what it really means beyond enforcing the law. And if we really want to instill that inside of our officers so that they fully understand the magnitude of what they're taking on, I think we'll start to actually get a change in behavior because we can have policies, we can train, we can do all this stuff. If it doesn't translate into change behavior on the street, it doesn't matter. The one incident that Bernard then talked about, she'll never forget. Despite all the good experiences she's had because she's in the business, she's been a police chief, she's got millions of good stories. But that one story sticks out. And we have to really think about that and we have to come up with ways in which we turn that around. Respect, respecting the people that we serve, not just giving lip service to it, but actually respecting. You know, when I was a, a young sergeant in uh, Chicago, I was, uh, I was working narcotics and I had a squad and you know, we'd go on, to, back in those days, I mean, you know, we didn't even have bulletproof vests. The city wouldn't buy us, we had to buy our own. Uh, you know, you literally knocked the door down with a sludge hammer. Uh, I mean, so it was, it was pretty rough duty. And we had one raid that we were going on that was particularly dangerous. Uh, gangs, uh, they knew they had to be heavily armed, all that sort of thing, and we didn't know what to expect. So when we went on that raid, we were very concerned. But I, I had one guy on my team, a detective by the name of Paris Patton, that had a knack for being able to flip uh, individuals. And by that I mean, you can take a person that's a suspect one day, you work with them and they become an informant for you the next, because he just had a way about him to communicate and just turn people around. Well, we went on the raid, and uh, after all the confusion was over and everything, Paris started to work his magic, and next thing you know, we got a couple guys that are gonna start providing information. And on the way back to the office to process the arrestees and the evidence, I remember asking Paris, and I said, man, how do you do it? How do you, how do you take these, these situations and you calm everything down and next thing you know, we got new informants? And he said, it's very easy. He said, uh, it's all about respect. And he told me a story that I'm gonna just mention now because I think it's, it's a way of kind of keeping in mind the, the, the circumstances that a lot of people live in. He said, at the moment of birth, everyone is a perfect 10, but take away three right away because life is temporary. It doesn't last forever. He said, if you come from a dysfunctional family, take away another three because you have absolutely no role models. You got domestic violence, you got maybe substance abuse, all these things going on. It's gonna be hard for a kid to find their way. He said, if you're a member of a minority group, take away another three because some doors may not be open to you that are open for others. He says, that leaves one. That one is that individual's dignity and self-respect. He said, do what you have to do as a police officer, but never ever do anything that takes away that person's dignity or self-respect, because that's all they got left and they will fight you to hold on to it. That's very true. Fate and circumstance, folks, is the only thing that separates us in life. And we can't afford to look down on those folks whose life may have taken a little different path than our own. We need to deal with crime. We need to deal with all that sort of thing. But even those that we arrest, we don't have to disrespect. When you start talking about building trust and legitimacy, that's, that's key, that's core to it, is how we treat those that we serve. You know, um, um, when you talk about when officer safety and wellness, and we talk about behavior, we weren't really focused on officers to get injured on duty, at least physically injured. We do a pretty good job. You get shot, stabbed, break an arm, leg, whatever. I mean, we take good care of you. You go to a hospital. I mean, really, there's treatment there. We take pretty good care of you. But it's the psychological trauma that officers are exposed to on a regular basis. It's that hidden injury that we really don't pay a whole lot of attention to unless it becomes something 
that uh, translates into behavior or something that's happened that draws your attention to it. The stuff that police are exposed to just is not normal. It just isn't. Child abuse, substance abuse, sexual assaults, robbery, shootings, homicide scenes, all these kinds of things. Yet what do we do for the mental well-being of our police officers, which is why we have a higher rate of divorce, a higher rate of suicide, uh, all these kinds of things, you name it, we probably are at the top if it's something negative. We have to find a way to be able to effectively deal with that if we expect officers to be able to, to act and, and behave differently on the streets. We also have to treat them differently internally. The average person who has nothing, who doesn't really understand policing thinks that we're very lax in terms of discipline and we let just anything go on. It's actually just the opposite. We're very punishment driven very punishment driven. We got rules and regulations. You screw up and do this, you got three days, you got four days, you got 30 days. We're going to fire you. So when we talk about concepts like procedural justice, it needs to be not only external, but it needs to be internal as well. And so how we treat our people internally has a bearing on how they then treat people out there on the street. So I, I, what I'm saying is that there's, there, we, there are a lot of moving parts to this, but if we, don't, if we don't reach the hearts and minds of the men and women that work for us, to see themselves differently, then community policing will never realize its full potential. One last thing. I think it even, as time has gone on, I, I begin to challenge certain things, and there's a metaphor in policing that's been around for, I don't know if anybody knows where it came from, um, and that's this, this idea of a police being a thin blue line. Someone said that it, it really started during the Civil War, during one of the battles or something, and, and I don't know if that's true or not. Again, I was never really a, that great a student of history. But whatever it is, it's been around policing for so long, nobody really remembers where it started. But I started to think about it. I had, bro I had I bought into it. I bought into it, uh, you know, with both feet. But when we really think about it, what is a, a line? We're separate and apart. I imagine it's a line that supposedly separates good from evil, good guys, bad guys. But when we're that line, we're like in between. What, what part, what, what side are we on? We're not a line that separates anything. I like to think of policing is more of a thread, a thread that's woven throughout the communities that we serve, a thread that actually helps hold together the fabric of democracy when you think about it. We have to think of ourselves differently. If we think of ourselves differently, we behave differently, and then we start to build the kind of real lasting trust and legitimacy that we need to be effective. This is an exciting time in our profession because it is a time for change. And, and like most large organizations, traditional organizations, it takes a crisis for us to really change. But we've got a narrow window of opportunity that I think is closing. I mean, right now, you turn on the news, all you hear about is, is the president, you hear about Congress, you hear about politics. That doesn't mean the problems that we, that, that we were dealing with in, in, in 2013, 14, and even before have gone away. They haven't gone away. They're still there. There's distrust that's still there. There are issues that are, that are bubbling beneath the surface that all it takes is one shooting, one incident for it to rise back up to the forefront. We have an opportunity to really put some things in place, and I fear that we aren't taking advantage of it, that somehow we're taking a breath and saying, well, you know, the heat's off a little bit. You know, nobody's really paying a lot of attention. People are paying attention, folks. Um, I'm uh, at a monitorship in, in Baltimore, and if you followed that trial that's going on with that gun task force, it makes the wire look like daytime TV for kids. It's bad. It's real bad. How do you build trust from there. But with that comes a tremendous amount of opportunity um, to really put something in place that's gonna be lasting. Uh, I'm gonna uh, stop now, and I didn't mean to ramble on, um, but I think it's important that we look beyond community policing and we think about those areas that are missing. 
we think about how do we capture the hearts and minds, how do we make this something more than just that we sit around and talk about a concept that we really look at this as just, it's just the way we deliver police services. It's the way in which we interact with folks. And as Joe mentioned with the Sir Robert Peel's uh, principles, you know, um, the public are the police and the police are the public. We're just those that are paid full time to do what's incumbent upon every citizen to do. How do we get back to that principle and make it a reality? Thank you. Commissioner, thank you so much for your remarks and for your service to this country. Uh, there's lots of things that make this law school special, and Professor Harmon's one of them. Very few people have influenced my career as, as much as she. So, Rachel, please. Um, thank you, um, Chief Longo and the other chiefs on this panel. It's an honor to serve with them. Uh, my experience pales in, compar in comparison, but this is actually my 20th year working almost exclusively on policing issues, first as a prosecutor focusing on misconduct, and then as an academic in research and working preventatively with departments and nonprofits, uh, including in Baltimore, um, with Chief Ramsey. Um, uh, so what I want to do today is talk just for a couple of minutes about the lessons that we can learn going forward from the experiences of the best chiefs and also the mistakes we've made over the decades that I've been in policing. Um, and there are three lessons I want to focus on for thinking about community policing in the 21st century. One is thinking about the relationship between um, police reform in terms of reducing misconduct and community policing and suggesting that we've treated those things separately and we have to bring them together. The second is that we have to be far more creative about the ways that we engage communities. And the third is something that's come up, and this, all of these will echo some of the themes that uh, uh, the chiefs have brought up today, um, that we have to think differently about data and transparency in thinking about the relationships with communities. So the first thing, as, as Chief Brown mentioned, um, community policing really started to spread um, significantly in the 1980s, and it represented a break both in philosophy and also in organizational management um, in terms of devolving leadership in policing so that decision making could be made in the field by um, officers who were engaged with the communities, in terms of working with the communities to identify priorities, and then in terms of problem solving, uh, as Chief DePino mentioned, um, developing partnerships to, uh, to actually work on problems. Decades later, or really starting at about a decade later, and then picking up throughout the 90s and continuing till today, there was a renewed focus on reducing consti constitutional violations and more important and more generally misconduct in policing by thinking of accountability in policing through um, the internal structure of a police department in a couple of pieces. If we built the right policies, the right training, the right supervision, and the right discipline, that would create internal accountability which would reduce misconduct. These two paths were largely treated separately. And they were separate from a third path, which was improving performance in policing. And so in the best departments, we've learned that these things can and need to be integrated. Um, and so in thinking about what's, what we should do going forward, it can't be that the same department that adopts community policing strategies also adopts ComStat metrics of measuring community performance that are incompatible with the uh, value of engagement. If we're measuring arrests on one hand and saying what we really care about is community engagement on the other, as Chief DePino pointed out, we won't get the right results. So we need to, we need to reintegrate um, thinking about police reform and community policing so that they're part of the same project. That means building engagement into the act of developing policies and developing training. That's something that's really on the top of our task list in Baltimore, is helping the department seek out community input into policy development. It means management practices that take seriously creating a culture of par partnership and transparency and accountability. Um, and it means de-emphasizing metrics like clearance rates and 911 call response times. The second lesson I think we can draw um, from the experiences of our best departments is that we have to think much more expansively about what community engagement needs. 
means. So traditionally, we talked about officer liaisons and community policing units and community advisory boards and civilian review boards. And I'm not saying that those are bad, but they often were institutionally weak and they captured a very narrow part of the community um, at much of the time. Now, we need to think much more expansively in the future about using social media, about taking input on websites, about um, not just broader community forums, but even focus groups and alternative mechanisms, surveys, um, to figure out what's going on in the community and take the input that the community has to offer about what priorities should be, what practices make sense for individual communities. A second piece of changing, thinking more robustly about community engagement is thinking differently about who we're reaching. Um, there are populations that are just not targeted by traditional community policing strategies, teenagers being probably the number one. Um, no teenager has ever served on, showed up to a neighborhood meeting or served on a community advisory board. Um, maybe not no teenager ever. But you know who teenagers are. They're absolutely critical to the relationship between the public uh, and community and uh, police departments, and yet they're absent from our traditional community engagement strategies. So we need to think differently about engaging those communities. Um, and then the final thing I'd say about thinking newly uh, about community engagement is that we have to not assume um, that community engagement has to always be through mechanisms of cooperation. Marginalized groups often refuse to uh, participate in government-sponsored mechanisms of community engagement, but precisely because they don't trust police departments or don't trust government more generally. And so if we really want to engage the community as departments, we need to think of cop watching and political protest and citizen complaints as forms of community input um, and not treat them as if they're a hostile force that we can't learn from. Um, the third lesson that we have to focus on in thinking about community policing in the 21st century is thinking differently in the way we do in every asset, a, uh, every aspect of our lives in the 21st century about what data and transparency mean uh, for community engagement. Communities can't weigh in about what police departments are doing if they don't know what they're doing. And of course, police departments can't tell them if they don't themselves know. But uh, collecting data um, and then pushing it out in new ways to the community is an incredibly difficult task. It requires much more sophistication in terms of IT, in terms of data management skills, in terms of generating community surveys that will give you meaningful responses than most departments and the many, many departments and many smaller departments have in the United States. So we need to think differently about IT support and um, a data collection and transparency um, as we think about building departments that can address community policing in the 21st century. Seattle, for example, in doing its um, recent set of reforms, did baseline surveys in the community that measured community trust and quality of interactions with officers, and then they repeated those surveys annually in a way that gives them an actual measure of how they're doing in outcomes in the community, and that has been not only informing their reform strategies, but it's also the process itself is building trust in the community. That's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I guess the final thing I'll say is that it's very easy to focus on the problems in policing today, and of course, there are many. Um, problems of excessive force and too many arrests, Many uh, departments are not responsive to their communities. They're very variable in training, supervision, and professionalism. And the Trump administration has uh, not only withdrawn the Justice Department from engaging in mandatory efforts to reduce misconduct, but cooperative efforts to reform departments and support community policing as well, um, as well as undermining faith in law enforcement in a variety of respects. So it's easy to be down. But actually, if you look at policing compared to any other institution in criminal justice today, whether it's prisons or prosecutors, courts, um, juvenile justice, 
Policing is unique because we can definitely say that policing is better today than it was 30 or 50 years ago. Um, I think that the energy you see among police chiefs, the creativity, the willingness to be progressive about ideas and embrace community policing um, is uh, incredible. I see it uh, all over the country. And so I expect that in 25 years, policing in the United States will be better still. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I had a schedule I was following, and that was to ask some questions. But, you know, I, I think I'm going to change that schedule because you've been very patient uh, in listening to our presenters and the information they've had to share. So I want to take this opportunity to open the floor up to all of you to ask questions, to make comments. Uh, and then if there's some time permitting, I'll, I'll come back to my questions. But I think your questions uh, are the more important questions to be answered. Professor Wall. Thank you, ma'am. Joe? A uh, terrific question for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, I think more often than not, there is not alignment between communities and police about the causation of crime. But more importantly, in many respects, the, the difference has even more to do with what to do about it or how to go about uh, dealing with that. And that's where I, I believe a lot of the conflict comes from. Uh, we've got a problem in, in policing that we historically, traditionally, have been the compilers of the information, the data, and we tend to look at it with, uh, with blinders on, that, that we're interpreting data and information a certain way. I think this is one of the reasons that uh, good data, solid information, and what I'm talking about now is not just the hard facts of, of uh, crime trends and patterns and things of that nature, but really engaging the community in a way that there's meaningful dialogue taking place. What we see from a policing perspective is uh, our point of view being reinforced and we're the holders of the information. We don't do a good enough job in sharing that and having uh, legitimate discussions with the community about their role and their input on that. I, I think that, that opportunity is oftentimes missed. That's one of the benefits, I believe, of community policing because you're forced into uh, meaningful dialogue, meaningful debate about uh, not just what's going on big picture, but what's going on in a particular neighborhood, what are the, the proper strategies, uh, the solutions, uh, how to engage uh, each other in ways that, that are going to get to the outcomes that you're all seeking in the first place. But that's not going to happen absent 
uh, ongoing, honest debate, feedback, uh, perspective, and, and hearing things that sometimes we don't want to hear. So I, my observation is that we get in our own way, and that's part of what we're trying to do uh, as a result of community policing, problem-oriented policing strategies. We're trying to change the way that we think about crime, the way that we look at, at uh, social disorder issues, and what could be done in the way of, of uh, the proper types of solutions. I don't know that that fully addresses your, your question, but it's, it's one of the issues that I see that stands in the way. And again, I think other uh, members of the panel can easily and readily comment on that too. The, the only thing I'd add is that um, I've just finished serving on the National Academy's panel on proactive policing in which we assessed uh, the effects of different proactive strategies um, in policing and the social science research over the past 20 years. And you shouldn't assume that community policing reduces crime. The, the, the social science evidence does not support that proposition. I think Chief Ramsey made the stronger case for community policing, which is that whether or not it reduces crime, it is essential to the legitimacy of policing in a democratic society. And so we, sh we, can't, n we can't treat it as a total instrumental project, which means that sometimes there will be disagreements and there will be issues that are unresolved. Um, and we have to think about the goals of community policing when we're assessing it. Just to add just one thing very quickly, when we talk about proactive policing and crime prevention, I think one of the mistakes that, uh, that we made, um, you know, broken windows policing is a good example of that, which can be very effective, but what we didn't think about was the collateral damage mm -hmm. that can be caused in a community. Uh, we didn't think about how, what, what should we do once the window has been fixed? So you go in there and, you know, uh, you're dealing with a particular uh, problem or issue, but what happens when that's no longer the same priority in the community? And can you continue with the same kind of uh, strategies or tactics that we uh, used? Uh, we have to be more surgical in our support, in our, in our approach in terms of removing crime from a community. You know, pulling up, backing up a wagon and locking everybody up on a corner is not the solution because not everybody on the corner has done anything, anything wrong. So we need to think about the collateral damage that's caused when we go in there. We need to work with the community to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and then know when to, to, when to adjust and when to get the community to a point where they then can take over and they can then sustain whatever gains that you made in a particular uh, community. So community building has got to be a part of the strategy because you can't stay there forever. And so the, a lot of the more challenged communities are not as organized in terms of community some are very organized, but some are not. And if they're not, then we have to give them the support they need to become more organized so they can sustain over time. I, I find that, you know, community doesn't expect police to stop all crime. As a matter of fact, I, I find that the way we handle crime in part of the community policing in, uh, that we do is that we handle it better. Um, citizens aren't expecting us to, oh, yep, I had a burglary, I expect you to go find the bad guy. But what they do expect is that you treat them with dignity, you take them seriously, you show them respect. Because we do citizen surveys, by the way, um, in our department. And I found that that modifies the behavior of the police officers. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I did the survey, um, it came back with, nah, the officers were fair, some were good, some were not so good. But as soon as the officers knew that there were surveys being taken, guess what? All the marks went up. Miraculous. It's funny. They're being watched. They're being not watched, but being held accountable. They're, they know that there's somebody that's going to give feedback on them. Um, but that's the biggest thing I find with the community is they're not looking for the police to necessarily stop crime, but they are looking to be treated with respect because I get more complaints about how officers handle the, the, their reports the wrong way than I do about the crime that's being um, committed within the community, and it should be the other way around. And to address your question about the groups that are not willing to sit down and, and talk with the police, that's one of the most challenging things I've faced in my whole entire career. Because um, uh, it's very frustrating to me as I like to have interaction with people. And, and I've had um, groups come in and they, I don't want to hear a thing you have to say, Chief, you're a liar, all police are liars. And I'm like, how do I engage with you if you don't want to at least talk to me? And have a relationship with me. So I don't have an answer to that other than it's very frustrating to me because I want to sit down and hear what everybody has to say because I can't change it unless I know what's going on. As soon as I know what's what's bothering you, then I can impact it. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't listen. I do listen. I do 
take it seriously. I just get very frustrated as I can't, there's not much I can do if no one's willing to talk to me about what they just, are, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Okay, okay, I get it, I'm wrong, but how do I make it better? Thank you, Chief. Sir. Yes, sir. I think oversight is useful, but I think we need to really be careful and make sure that we define responsibilities. Uh, for an example, I believe very strongly that the head of the organization, a commissioner, police chief, whatever the title is, be the final decision maker when it comes to discipline and things like that. But community input at that level, I found to be very, very helpful. When we were rewriting our use of force policies in Philadelphia, for an example, uh, the mayor had created an oversight group uh, to really, you know, kind of monitor. We were part of collaborative reform, uh, which one step short of a consent decree, but very important in terms of really doing the things you need to do to correct many of the uh, issues that you have in your department. The feedback we got was incredibly useful. First of all, we get in policing, we, we use terminology and jargon and just assume everybody knows. But when we get feedback saying, what does this really mean? It's not clear to me. Then we had to rewrite it in a way in which it was clear, because we just assume police officers really understand, they may or may not really fully understand what it is we expect from them. And so having clearly written policy, for an example, is very important. And so uh, having someone else, a third party, you know, looking to see what it is you're doing, how you're doing it, uh, is very important. We wound up putting all of our directives online. Uh, all these kinds of things, I, the public needs to know, but they also need to know the, the, the limitations. We use the term and throw it around a lot, transparency. Well, there are some things that, guess what, we're not gonna share. Um, open investigations, there's certain critical information that can't be shared, but we need to let people know exactly what can and what cannot be shared so there aren't unrealistic expectations in terms of information that we're going to, uh, to provide. And so uh, having that oversight group, I think, uh, allows you to have those kinds of discussions and, and, and set a course. Um, so I'm in, in favor of it. Quick comment on that, too. I've, I've worked with a number of communities that have uh, various forms of oversight. I've actually worked with communities setting up oversight bodies and panels. 30, 40 years ago, I was very much opposed to the concept of civilian oversight. I've done a 180 over the course of, of those years. Uh, but I'm in agreement with, with uh, Chuck as well on this, and that is that I believe that ultimately the police chief commissioner needs to have the final authority responsibility for the disciplinary issues. Hold the chief, uh, the, the chief executive officer accountable for that. But the, the community does and should have a very legitimate role in all of that. The one downside of this that I've seen, I have yet to see any, there's, there's a number of different forms of oversight a lot of work that's been done in this arena over the, the years and recent decades. There's four or five fundamental, uh, there's, there's four fundamental and, and then a hybrid uh, form that's often referred to different concepts or forms of civilian oversight. I have yet to find any community that is really satisfied with their uh, civilian oversight. There's, there's none out there that's quote perfect. And, and frankly, I don't believe there ever will be because you have different uh, groups, different factions that have different uh, perspectives about this, different expectations for it, and you cannot possibly satisfy all of them. So that's one of the biggest challenges for the local policymakers, trying to come up with some form that is, is reasonable, that can accommodate uh, the needs, the expectations, the interests of, of so many different constituencies out there. And that needs to be understood going into it, and it's something that everybody needs to accept that they're gonna encounter uh, that type of, uh, of resistance and criticisms, no matter what form of oversight is put in place. Professor Harmon, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you've certainly done a lot of, of work in the area of police reform. Is there any one particular type of civilian oversight that works better than others? Um, no. Well, I mean, the answer is we don't know or no, um, one or the other. The, the Which do you prefer? <laughs> well, I have to say that if you, I, I, if, if, uh, uh, Chief Brand has come 180 on this. I've come 360 on this. I was in favor of civilian oversight, 
until I started to see over um, many years how weak uh, civilian uh, review boards were as institutions. They often um, didn't satisfy the communities for some of the reasons that have been mentioned, not just because there are diverse interests, but because there are to limits to what they can do. And in fact, I don't think they, they I mean, there's no evidence that they meaningfully reduce misconduct. Um, I think uh, for many different reasons, depending on the model, but I've come around again towards the importance of them because even as the evidence showed that they did no better than internal affairs in terms of sussing out or disciplining misconduct, communities continued to demand them. Why? Because they wanted to be engaged in the process. And so I have come 360 on this and said, you know, actually, we do need civilian oversight, not because of its instrumental gains, but because it's part of the process of governing police and the public has to be involved in that process. Thank you. Jeff.
Well, if I can just very quickly address uh, a couple of your concerns. Uh, the very first recommendation in the President's Task Force report was that a commission be established to look at the entire criminal justice system. It hasn't been done since the mid-1960s, mm -hmm. uh, to look at not just police, but also look at prosecution, look at courts, look at corrections, look at reentry, look at those things that lead to people uh, turning toward crime. I mean, we need to have a comprehensive strategy. This isn't just about police. And if you're going to, you know, let's stop arrests, okay, but what are the alternatives to incarceration that we can, that we can then use in order to correct behavior, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be uh, incarceration. But you've gotta be, you gotta have some place to be able to deal with that. Uh, and that goes beyond just what police can do. That's why you got to look at the entire criminal justice uh, system, in, in my opinion. I'm certainly not unaware, and I don't know if there are many police officers that are unaware of abuses in the past in terms of particularly communities of color, uh, African American communities, which I'm 68 years old and I've been African American all my life. So uh, it, it's not something that's, that's foreign to me. One of the things that I didn't mention in my earlier remarks, but a separate program that we started, uh, which is educational, both these things, both the Holocaust Museum and what I'm about to say is educational. But the National Constitution Center is located in Philadelphia. And I stopped by there one day to see exactly what it is they do, and they have an educational program that really traces the history of our democracy from 1776 to the current period of time. And what I asked them to do is what if we took a snapshot of policing that are the same time frame. Now, in 1776, you didn't have organized police forces. But you may have had people performing a police-like function, tr tracking down slaves on a plantation or whatever it might be. Fast forward to the civil rights movement. I mean, who was waiting for marchers coming across the Pettus Bridge? Uh, it, it, the police. Police have not always stood on the right side of justice as we would define justice today. And we need to know that, we need to acknowledge it and understand why is there more baggage in some communities and distrust versus others. But I remember something that Joel Osteen uh, uh, said, who I watch periodically on television, uh, 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 a uh, minister. Uh, he said there's a reason why the rear view mirror on a car is smaller than the windshield. It's because it's not meant for you to spend too much time looking behind you. You gotta keep your eyes focused on where you're going. But it's always good to take a glance back every now and then because you need to know where you're coming from. And I, I, we use that in order to create this program at the Constitution Center that our officers, our recruits, and so forth go through along with a discussion with young people, a uh, facilitated discussion around their views of policing. So there's a way of incorporating history so that you understand the baggage that's there. You can't change it, but you can change it going forward. But you need to understand it. And we have to make people aware because they weren't born during that time. They had nothing to do with that. The president of IACP, two presidents ago, I think it was, Terry actually Cun did. Terry, Terry yeah, Cunningham. Terry Cunningham actually did apologize uh, openly. And, and so, I mean, we can do that sort of thing, but the bottom line is most people care, well, where the hell are you going now? What are we going to do about these things? And you can't do it unless you take a comprehensive look at the entire system, not just police. You talk about transparency. You think these prosecutors don't need transparency? You think courts don't need it? You think corrections don't need it? We all could benefit from it. But the only thing people focus on is the police, and that's why this will never really take hold the way it ought to take hold, because we aren't being honest about the issues and the problems that exist and what it's going to take to correct them. I want to add something to you. A lot of the points you make really resonate with us because we're, the police department's now being tasked with handling social issues that really mm -hmm. are never our responsibility right. as law enforcement. Homelessness, Public mental health, health issues, drug addiction, it's all been put onto law enforcement and we are trying to come up with solutions on how to resolve the, the problems. And, and, and one of the challenges we have in, in Sarasota is homelessness. And one of the things we did was we created a homeless outreach team and we have a mental health court to keep people with mental um, illness away from being in jail because I agree with you. People with mental health issues should not be in jail. But then what are the alternatives? And there are none. There are zero. And um, Florida, the state I come from, is 50th, <laughs> the last, to be funded for mental health issues. Um, so we need to look beyond, as the, the chief was saying, beyond just law enforcement, um, because we're taking on a lot of these responsibilities. 
um, to share with you is that uh, one of the things that I did do when I talked to members of my community about law enforcement is told them that we were sorry, that I was sorry for the injustices that were done to the people in the community. Uh, but I, I, and I did it many times, <laughs> several times over, and it came a point where it's okay, we have to be done with that. And as the chief said, we've got to now move forward um, because I, there were police officers that are, were never born during the time frame that that took place. But the current president of the ICP went back to his community because there was an injustice in his department. He wasn't, I don't even know if he was an officer at the time when the incident took place. And he apologized to the community and to the family for what the police department didn't do. So I think if you really looked into it, you'll see that chiefs and law enforcement is taking responsibility and recognizing um, what their role was in the past. I visited Memphis, Tennessee, the Civil Rights Museum, and uh, other than the Holocaust Museum, which those are the two most moving um, uh, locations that I've been to in my life, um, uh, I, uh, I was committed again after going to Memphis. That I wasn't gonna let our police officers go back to that again. Police with police dogs on people that were um, uh, protesting without violence. How, how did we get to that place? So while you don't really look a lot in the past, you never forget it because you never want to go back to that because I am a studier of history. Is those who forget the past are bound to repeat it. I'm not going to let that happen. I don't know any chiefs that work with me or around me, and I know a lot of them that ever want that to ever happen again, and they're going to, are fighting hard to do it. So we need the community. That's where community policing comes in to help us, to help us with those all those social issues. And I think you missed what I said earlier is we can't arrest everybody. We shouldn't be arresting everybody. But as um, uh, Chief Ramsey said too, is that, okay, so what do we do with people when they break the law? Where, what is the, the venue that we put that person into so that they don't break the laws again? What do we do? Right now, law enforcement is stuck with one thing, jail. We need help above us, and I think you give us more power than we have, because I don't know how much influence we have on change in the, <laughs> the, the guidelines for sentencing, and I, if they would listen to me about that, great. I, they'll, maybe they'll listen to me about some other things. We don't have that much uh, power. We say it, we can talk, we can say it, but I don't know if we have that much influence. I think you're giving us more credit than, than we have. I understand now. Gotcha, I understand, that makes sense. Commissioner, thank you, Chief. Mr. Bevel, thank you. Uh, Professor Williams? I'm a big fan of Mary Parker Follett. Circular response, uh, did some seminal work uh, back at that time. Um, I'm not really sure where to go with your question though. Could you just uh, reframe that for me? But in a way, this takes me back uh, to her work again, too, in the notion of circular response. And, and it really starts with you've got to listen. Um, and, and I think that's been a problem for us in, in the industry. Um, we're so used to telling in, in a variety of different ways. And it's, it's something, it's, it's almost as though it's uh, instilled in young officers. And as they move forward in the course of their careers, too, it's always about being very directive. Um, hence, the, the, the change with, the, the, it's the importance of community policing. We have to listen to the community, all elements of the community, in order to really understand and to formulate collectively uh, the types of responses and solutions that, that 
we're in need of. Uh, and, and that changes the way the government operates. Um, when I talk about community, I did a presentation back in the 80s to the League of Cities. And uh, sp specifically, I was asked to come in and talk about the concept of community policing st across the country, but still seen as being very early in its uh, formative stages. And the comment, the observation I had then is no different today, and that is that we've got to get away from drawing this distinction about community policing. It's ultimately about community-oriented governance. It's really changing the way that we function, that we operate at all levels of government, especially local and, and state government. Uh, that's where you're closest to the people. That's, that's where you've got to engage in, in some uh, meaningful ways. And I think that until such time, in the way I'm going to go back to the other comments a moment ago about um, uh, the role of police, and, and police are seen as being the oppressors. Um, I'm not trying to defend the mistakes, the errors that have, have uh, been made over the years, but the reality is police are an agent and arm of government. And these actions, these activities, are the result of public policy decisions, uh, local level, state level, federal level. Police are ultimately the ones that are uh, turned to, to carry out certain types of responsibilities and actions. That doesn't mean that we uh, can or should abdicate our responsibility for ensuring that these things are done in a constitutional manner. Um, but nonetheless, police end up getting sucked in to the process. They're seen as uh, the oppressors. If, if we're going to change this dynamic and really listen to it, if we're going to change the way that, that uh, governmental agencies um, interact with the public, then we've got to change the behavior at all levels. And that, this is where it comes back to policymakers. Public policymakers are listening, understanding. Uh, they've got to be more sensitive to their role and the types of uh, pu public policy decisions that are being made and ultimately legislation that's being enacted. Going back to that point again, it's uh, w what happened with uh, uh, drug laws, uh, the, the enforcement. That, that became a vehicle for oppressing particular communities without question. Was it recognized up front? No, not necessarily. I think some people were sensitive to it, but by and large, no. It was seen as being a solution, uh, once again, a policing solution as opposed to uh, a proper type of a societal response. And police are cast into this role of trying to react to all of these issues. But what I've watched over the course of my career is the uh, elimination of a lot of the resources that we once had at our disposal. Uh, social services agencies, uh, dealing with the mentally ill. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with L.A. County right now. L.A. County Jail is the biggest single mental health provider in the county because about 30 percent of their, their jail population suffer from mental illness. They're being housed largely because of mental illness issues and there's no other avenue to turn to anymore. Those are the, all the result of public policy dec decisions uh, that have been made over the years, over the last 40 years or so, that are severely affecting, impacting the way that we do policing the in this country and how we use criminal justice resources for a variety of, of uh, social ills and problems that are not being confronted or not being adequately funded elsewhere. So I'm sorry for the uh, going off on the tangents here, but <coughs> those are some of the issues that I see that are, that are at work. And just to address one other thing is, I I think police are the best ways of policing our community. I, I think there's no more honorable occupation. The majority of the time, the large majority of the time, law enforcement officers do the right thing for the right reason at the right time. And the way that I encourage people that want to have engagement with the law enforcement process is become a police officer. And we're having a hard time recruiting people to want to get into this occupation. And I think that's the best way for you to have an impact in your community is get involved in the process, whether it's through a civilian oversight group or become a law enforcement officer. So I can tell you, it's not easy to become a police officer. Most of you in here already know at the backgrounds, most people couldn't pass backgrounds. Um, the mental health scrutiny that you have to go through, the financial, who you dated, where you lived, everything that we do to try to find the best police officers. And we were talking a little bit uh, yesterday, maybe we need to change that process just a little bit mm -hmm. to find the right character of a, of a person to come in. Because sometimes you're picking people that are real gung-ho, they think they're going to go into like a militaristic style um, uh, organization. And maybe it needs to be much more of collaborative, team building, let's communicate. We need more women in law enforcement, by the way. Um, just a little plug. Uh, but 
no matter who it is, we need people that have those kind of personality traits to be able to, to police better. So we need more citizens to get involved in that process. But again, most honorable occupation I think there is. I'm very proud of being in law enforcement. We've been under a lot of scrutiny and criticism. Some of it deserve it, but for the most part, I think we do a, a really good job. And I think if you talk to most chiefs, they work really hard to bring up the level of professionalism in their departments. And they're, and unfortunately, and, and this is just a fact, they're the first person that gets fired when something goes wrong. Why is the police chief getting fired when something goes wrong in a community? They're the fall person. And um, it's how about the elected officials? What about the, uh, uh, um, the hospitals that are not there? What about the, all the social organizations that aren't in a community? They're not being held accountable, but somebody's got to take the fall, and it's a police chief. And um, I thank God there are people that are still willing to be in that job, which we were talking about. We're having a hard time recruiting. Who wants to, who wants to be the front page on the top fold, as they say? Chief, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, how about eeny, meeny, miny, mo? <laughs> Sir, last question. Thank you. Well, I, I, first, I think that the International Association of Chiefs of Police have been calling for years and years and years to have a, um, a criminal justice reform study been, been done, and I know that was something that Chief Ramsey recommended in the 21st century community policing um, research that was done. There needs to be a nationwide um, uh, group put together, and it has been since 1968 was the last time they did any type of a study. By the way, I was only four years old then, so I may not have read that. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, but I was only four years old. That's how long ago it was since um, uh, and they did any type of real nationalized study of law enforcement and what works and what doesn't work. Um, so I think there needs to be something, but I have to tell you, the military is stealing from law enforcement because you look at the hearts and mind philosophy that the military is using when it goes into the Middle East, they're changing people's philosophy by getting to know people, helping them dig for water, doing things in the community, which is what the police taught them how to do, and then somehow we're, we're actually taking a lot of things that the military is doing because we're facing a lot of the same type of threats that the military is facing and we have to be able to blend the two there's a time to be militarized when we're facing a terrorist who's shooting at people and citizens in active shooter situations and bombs and such but the majority of what we do as policing is really not it's the day-to-day -day interaction with people and humanization um, and it's tough to balance the two because you're teaching our officers to be warriors but you're also teaching them that they have to be uh, multiple other hats, social workers, um, uh, caregivers, you know, all of the things that they're supposed to do. It's a challenge. It's challenging, but I think it's an opportunity. <clears throat> One thing we could do, because you're, you're right, we are decentralized. You know, some say we have as many as close to 18,000 police departments in the United States. Uh, wait, half that would be too many, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But one way of being able to kind of get some standardization. Um, most states, if not all, as well as the District of Columbia, have a uh, training and standards board. There is an organization, uh, IATALYST, I have no idea what each letter stands for, but uh, they, do, uh, they do meet. These are directors of all the different training boards. And if, we could, if they could come up with a core curriculum, an educational program that every officer, both new as well as in service, had to go through, then you'd be able to, I think, very quickly start to see across the country uh, more systemic change in policing. But every state is different. The requirements in every state is different and so forth. So there is there a way? I, I think so, but is there a willingness? That's debatable as to whether or not there can be agreement on what some of those core things ought to be that really would be of benefit to the profession. The willingness, I think, is the, the big key in this, too. Um, and, and I can think of a number of, of examples here, but one quick one is back in the 90s, uh, when I was the director of the cops office, I was willing to provide the state, uh, the, the, the body that we're referring to here, IADLIS, the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Training Centers. And I was willing to provide them collectively or individually funding 
to, to go back and address their basic uh, core academy curricula to really integrate community policing principles into this and we were trying to seek uh, an overarching approach. The interesting thing is that they weren't willing to do it. Um, and this was, I, I was willing to give each and every one of them a million dollars to just take on that project uh, at, at the state level. So that reflects, I think, to a great extent, uh, the differences of opinion that exist. In my view, a lot of that was rooted in the people that were running those state uh, training centers or responsible for those bodies were by, by and large the old guard, highly resistant at that stage. Uh, some of them just did not see the, the necessity, the importance of doing this. There's actually been a change. There's, I, I, I don't want to paint them with a, a broad brush here because there's been a lot of change and a number of them have taken these types of issues on in the last 20, 25 years or so. But it's a slow process and, and uh, we've got to find ways to overcome some of this uh, natural intransigence or, or resistance that exists too. I'd add two things to that. One is you asked for analogies. Uh, Jim Ryan, the future president of the university, and I talked more than a decade ago about writing an article called Teachers, Cops, and Nurses because the two natural analogies are um, uh, medical care, which is also decentralized in our communities, and teaching, which is obviously decentralized. And the three are regulated totally differently, and so they're really nice. You're drawing out the parallels and the lessons from each is worth doing, but hasn't yet been done. He and I got busy and we never wrote the article. <laughs> um, and I think now he's got a real job, I don't know. Uh, and then the other thing you asked is, why not some award centers of excellence in policing? Uh, the, the comments that have been made in response to your question were about standards um, and not rewarding excellence. It's very, very hard to reward excellence in policing um, in a very public way. I've always thought it would be a good thing to do in part to celebrate the energy of progressive chiefs because the rewards for being on the front line of progressive chiefing are, are sometimes limited, but it's very hard to do. No, <coughs> but no, the federal government will never do it. Chief Longo and I talked about doing something with the Miller Center at one point, but it's very hard because you stand up and say, Anthony Batts, the new progressive chief in America, and then you get Freddie Gray, you don't look so good. And every department has problems and every department can have incidents of, that are tra tragic and criminal um, to, uh, combined, and that means that um, nobody wants to be the one who celebrates uh, success um, for fear of what's coming down the pike in the future, and that puts us in a difficult position um, with respect to thinking in positive ways about rewarding positive policing. I want to encourage you. As, a, as though you were a prop in my audience. <laughs> <laughs> my, our dream, at least in the School of Continuing and Professional Studies, is in fact to build that Center for Excellence, to bring it here to the grounds of the University of, of, of Virginia, this public institution who has an obligation to contribute back to this community and to this sacred profession. And so that's our goal, and God willing, that goal will come to fruition. I have a deep Rolodex, and these are just but a few cards in that Rolodex that I will keep looking to to help build this, uh, this program out. And so I thank each of you for being here, for your contributions to this panel, for the communities that you serve to this great profession of, of American law enforcement. And I thank all of you for coming here today and listening. This will be the first of many discussions we will have in the weeks and months and years to come around this, uh, this important topic. So thank you. God bless. Have a great day.